everyone. Hope you well. I've been looking forward to this for some time now. First of all, I'd like to welcome back to our family of press family, uh, Gary Kant. Gary, I'm glad to, to see you here, mate. And uh, I'm glad to see you looking so much better than you've been and improving all the time. Oh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to doing battles with you in due, in due course. <laughs> but for now, welcome back. Cheers, thank you. The last time I saw you, I think it was in the tribunal was, back in Manchester. And I, I did say to you, we're going to sign Daniel Vido and uh, uh, Justin Carney. And you argued with me. <laughs> and I said to you, you are entitled to your opinion. But in my opinion, your opinion is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back, and I'm looking forward to doing battles with you. Cheers, thank you. Um, following that tribunal I was referring to, the RFL initiated uh, an investigation into the affairs of our club. And soon afterwards, we'll, they've um, issued some charges. And um, in, in their findings of that investigation, I, I need to make this absolutely clear that they found the club have not breached any salary cap regulations in 2016, so we were clear there. The same applied to 2015. However, they charged us for uh, on six things. One, can you read that, yeah? That we breached the 2014 salary cap. And just to protect the, the privacy of players or clubs, Etc. I'm not going to mention any names or clubs. I'm just going to refer to them as A, B, C, D, and F. So the second charge against the club was involving player A to do with a car given to him. Player B side payment. Four, player, C, rent. Five, player, D, rent, payment. When I say rent, rent that we have made on behalf of the player that we haven't declared in the salary cap. And six, player, E, to do with leadership training and payment that has been made to that particular player. And it's the tribunal um, that involved, that I was referring to earlier with Gary, that involved the player E. A hearing uh, took place uh, on the 25th of April at the RFL that took three hours to consider all the cases there, where this particular case took almost two days in an employment tribunal. So for all the cases there to be discussed, you know, to consider the outcome and to come up to a conclusion, it only took three days, sorry, three hours. The club was found not guilty in here this, the car. No evidence whatsoever was presented to the tribunal as in regarding player B, so that was dismissed. They claimed that we should have declared a rent payment of 7,500 pounds as in regarding to player C. We should have declared a rent of 10,800 there and according to the statement of the player a total of 32,900 pounds sorry 32,200 pounds I think the exact figure um, regarding player E now if you add the three sums involved here the, the exact amount was 51,200,000 pounds. And this is the figure I'm gonna come back to 
in a minute. Before I do that, layer E is to do with, and I, you know, for this, because this subject is in a field, I don't really want to go in details. But I'd like to ask my colleagues at the RFL, guys, you knew about this in October 2014. Why didn't you take action then? And maybe Mark Green is right in wanting to know why didn't they take action there. And this very file that, that the RFL produced, there's evidence there, there's written evidence to indicate that the RFL had known about this back in October 2014. And I know they did because I discussed it with them as well. Also, player C, which I believe it's total administrative mistake, but on our part, which was corrected, was it in March 2015, whatever. It's to do with a rent that we were paying on behalf of a player that we did not declare in the salary cap. But that's totally a mistake. But again, the RFL knew about this. And they knew about it more than a year ago. Why didn't they do something then? Why wait until basically the end of last year to start an investigation? They didn't need to start an investigation. The information is there in black and white. But nevertheless, that's a decision we reached that they found us guilty with a payments of 51,000, 200,000, sorry, 51,200 pounds. That they claim. Yes. Yeah. Maybe uh, I'll say. Now the exact figure, 7,500, 10,800, and 32,200. So that's 32,200. That's 10,800, and that's 7,500. Um, check my exact figures, but this and it's neither here or there, but it's uh, an amount of around the 51,000. Then, all of a sudden, I get a letter and the claims were made in the tribunal that says Salford have exceeded their total aggregate liability of 1.9 one nine two hundred for a period of 109 days. That means we are over the cap by 94,200. 94,200. Trying to think. You run a life salary cap you monitor that salary cap. You don't allow anybody to go over that salary cap. And even if Salford, on every single day of that salary cap, we're spending the total amount, i.e. the 1.825, surely the maximum that we could have reached, breached is by 51,000. This is a schoolboy error. There's no way on earth we could have been in breach of the cap by that amount. Now, for the benefit of those, and I'll come back, I'll, I'll use this word. For the benefit of those who are not familiar with what's meant by a life salary cap, 
It's almost like a bank statement, right? You start the season with whatever theirs you've got. You submit that to the RFL, and we are the rate marker. And let's say the salary cap is 1.825 million, right? You go to the RFL and you say, Mr. RFL, this is the players we've got at the start of the season. We'd like to reject. Ignore those payments, the side payments for now, right? Because obviously we didn't declare them at the time. And they'll take the figure of us, and through the season, you move players out and you move them in, like every other club. And the salary cap officer will make sure no club exceeds that amount. And in actual fact, and I've got our salary cap position here. And before the meeting, I had shared the information I've got here with one of you guys, Ian, right? And even if you to add that amount of money to our log or the amount of money we were spending, the amount of money we were spending Ranged from 1.75, and sometimes it's 1.622. We only reach the cap of this 1.825 on the 9th of July until the 17th of July. 2014, so during this period, we go above this red line by something like 50K, right? So their claims of 109 days is absolutely ridiculous. And they could, and I'll come back to that in a second, and for me, when I look at why they've done it, I would say they either deliberately misled the judge of the tribunal, or they were totally incompetent. So I started looking, why did we reach the cap by 50K during that season, during that time? I always knew we had enough money in the cap to spend money. To those who follow or followed our club, I take you back to May of 2014, in which we had a player called Jay Fulani. Do you remember him? And he used to be our fullback. And in May 2014, we've also signed, sorry, yeah, 2014, we signed Kevin Locke to come to us in December of the following year. But unfortunately, uh, Jay suffered an injury on the 17th of May, long-term injury, long, you know, and he was out for the season. So I went to the RFL, I said to them, Mr. RFL, we need the overseas spot for Jay, and we need to free room in the cap. Can you please de-register Kevin, sorry, Jay, in order to bring Kevin from Australia? And the answer was yes. And we brought Kevin back. We, we brought Kevin into the club in July. Now, you would have thought a sensible governing body would have deregistered Jay, then registered Kevin. They've done it the other way around. So, on the 9th of July, they registered Kevin, and only deregistered Jay on the 17th of July. 
which resulted in the club going over the cap for that week. If they want to dispute the facts, then we only went over the cap by that amount for that length of time. And the, during which time we only played one game, and that is the uh, game we played against Hull at sea, I think. Right, there's a reason why I said the 9th of July here. Because for you, some of you, I would like you to look at the date in which Kevin Locke made his debut for us. He played at Huddersfield on Sunday that I believe it was the 5th of July. Mr. Arafali, are you telling us that you allowed Kevin Locke to play without being registered? Your salary log is full of elementary errors. And for a governing body to be producing something like that, I would be embarrassed being part of a sport that's governed by a body, right, that produces a log like this. This log is almost like a bank statement. Just imagine if you received a bank statement and said to you, you know, you started with 100 pounds, then there's a withdrawal here of 20 pounds. I'm not giving you the date of the withdrawal. Or you withdraw 30,000 pounds, but we will confirm the date. This is what the log says here to me. There's a number of entries here without dates. There's a number of entries here that says to confirm Guys, this is 2014. Are you not capable of monitoring a cap, the salary cap? The salary cap is at the heart of the competition. There's a players here out on our cap that were on loan. But nevertheless, if we to accept we have made mistakes and this is what we've got, then this is my argument of why we went over the cap for that time. So really, this is a technical breach and we haven't breached the cap whatsoever. Their figures of 94,200, where it's 51,200, it's, you know, they should be embarrassed. And to claim it was for 109 days, it's embarrassing. I am aware that mistakes weren't just made with my club, monitor their salary cap. There was another club that they went over the cap by about, not about, by the exact amount of 158,060 pounds during 2014. And we can't, don't even start to speculate about the club. Right, this is a live salary cap. And if the club goes over the cap, good luck to them. The people who were responsible for monitoring the cap are at fault. And on the 8th of December, a meeting took place in Media City for a coffee, and they turned around and said to this club, no action will be taken against you. Guys, you could understand why I'm so frustrated. A, it starts here, deliberate misleading of the court by false claim. Looking at our life salary cap, we haven't breached. And still dishing out a six point penalty. Despite the fact those facts were in their possession almost two years ago, 
uh, to bring it and charge us now when we're just getting our house in order is disgusting to say the least. So where do we go from here? We want to appeal. And last week, we had uh, asked RFL whether they would consider listening to the appeal or referring the appeal to an independent body that they, they themselves recognize, which is uh, the sports resolution. It's totally independent of Salford, totally independent of the RFL. And for a week, we haven't heard from them. But when I spoke to my lawyer this morning, he says to me, we just heard from them, and they're saying, referring the appeal to the sports resolution is under the discretion of the RFL. And they will only make that decision once they had seen the grounds of the appeal. I shall fact, I, you know, there's so many grounds in which we could appeal. And I really wanted to know where is the appeal gonna take place before we decide. And I, I just don't know why the RFL needs to see our grounds of appeal in order to make their decision. If nobody has anything to hide, Let's take the case to an independent appeal. Somewhere independent, away from Red Hall, and it's, it could only be fair to, you know, it's fair to everybody there. So in conclusion, before I move into other stuff, I, w I would like to know, or I would like the RFL to come out and answer, give an answer to everybody. Why they waited for so long from October 2014 and July uh, 2015, when they had the evidence, why did they wait for so long to come out and charge the club? Are there other situations, are they doing the same with other people and they're only gonna charge clubs if it come, becomes public? They had no more evidence now than they did have then. Second point I'd like to know is they need to explain why they have given the hearing wrong figures, i.e. the discrepancy between these two laws. And they need to explain their failure in monitoring a salary cap I spoke yesterday about our fear, my fear for the future of rugby league. And I'm aware and everybody here is aware of the next Aussie TV deal. And I'm thinking the sport is facing a lot of challenges. And um, we're not careful not only will we become a feeder competition to the NRL, but it could threaten the status of the sport, i.e. maybe become a semi-professional sport rather than what it is now. And do I look at the people who are leading us, the likes of Nigel Wood or Ralph Rimmer and Karen Morehouse, and I look at what's going on here and there, and the lack of commercial, you know, the income that they're generating. Do I think they are capable of taking us to the next level of facing the challenges we facing? I don't think so. Unfortunately, my good friend, Nigel, and instead of standing up to these challenges, goes out and brings in a team from 
a second team from France, and a second team from uh, Canada. And I'll, let me just, I'll come back to those two teams. I don't know what's the logic behind it, right? I mean, is he trying to create two more Catalans in the competition, which I presume the Alchemite, and why would the Canadian be wanting to invest so much money if the ultimate aim is not to be in Super League. But let's look at Catalans, right? They are, unless we fund them. If we play Wakefield, for example, my club will bear the travel expenses to go there. If Wakefield come to play us, they pay their own travel expenses. When we go to play Catalan, we have to fund a substantial amount of money for travel. If Catalan comes to play us, we also have to fund their travel expenses. Their participation in the sport, apart from the amount of money they take in, the, in central funding, is costing each club around 100,000 pounds. I am all for growing the sport. Not in this country, but uh, in other countries, including in France. But I know 10 years ago, the French said their aim is to have 75% of their players playing for France, qualified to play for France. That's on, on record. I look at the team that we played recently. 11 of them do not qualify to play for France. That's about 70, natural that it's almost 75% of the players don't qualify to play for France. So we failed there. We failed to grow the sport. But then when I look at the players closely, I noticed there are at least nine overseas players. I'm not counting Jody and Richie Myler being because they're English. Nine non-European players. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute. Every team is allowed only seven. How come Catalan is getting 11? Sorry, nine. You know, rugby league is a small village. For us owners, we get offered players that end up going to somewhere else. Every agent will shop a player around. And after our game, and I, when I looked at their starting 13, and I put the value down to what I think they're worth. Starting 13, almost more than 1.82 pounds. So, I mean, what have we achieved in investing so much money in France? We have to grow in the game. We contribute to the local economy. I think our fans and players, when they go over there, throughout the course of the year, they must contribute at least 10 million pounds the local economy when they come here, other than funding their travel expenses, they don't bring any fans because the number of French players playing the team is not the 75% we told they were going to be. The government of the RFL, I think it's their baby, Catalan is their baby. And when we look at the discipline, for example, we look at what Dave Taylor has done to a couple of our players, and we just said, no, it's okay, we, we clear it. If that could happen, if one of our players done it to theirs, would it be a lot more severe? And I'm saying these things, I have a lot of respect for people in Catalan, their players, a lot of them, people I socialize with and I know, it's not against them. It's against the governing body that allowed them to get away with something like that. 
Then all of a sudden we hear from our good friend Nigel that Toulouse are real and they are in championship one. Not against that. As long as it doesn't end up another Catalan, i.e. we fund them and they cost them their sport money. Straight away I'm told that uh, actually Toulouse are getting some favors already. And I asked what it is. He says, this person I was talking to says, every championship club gets about 75,000 pounds. Toulouse get uh, an access of 200,000. Wow. Where's the money coming from? Apart from spending from Super League. We play uh, competitions, you know, whether it's uh, Super League, Championship, or Championship One, where it's uh, uh, level playing field. So I'd like to ask the Arafal question. How come you're giving Toulouse more money than any other championship one? Finally, come back to Toronto. And something that I really don't know whether Toronto uh, tried uh, uh, some of the ideas my good friend Nigel came up with. But it's assumed They will fund everything. And Toronto, and good luck to them, and I hope it does work. Because I'm all out, I'm all for growth. But we need to do things and we need to be careful. We need to consider, for example, with the French, you know, what are the benefits and what is the cost? They're talking about TV money. Is it going to be similar to the TV money that we are getting out? from the French. Does anybody know what the value here? No? 50,000 euros a year. That's the value of the TV, French TV money. I hope it's not going to be just 50,000 uh, Canadian dollars for the Canadian. But we are allowing here group of people to go out and sign players. And they already started signing players and coaches, etc. And it is a risky venture. One question I would like to ask Arafal. This club you are given a license to, to operate in Championship 1. Have they provided you with a proof of funding? And if the answer is yes, then my second question have you got bank guarantees to secure the future of the players that they are signing and the viability of the club for the three years? I'm going to stop here and I'm going to take any questions. I don't really know, but according to the log, salary cap log here, now we would have been given the players because what you do is you send your player, you know, the, your 19, and if there's any problems, you can keep. But according, and you want to come over, I'll show you this. Can anybody before the, this year find out when did Kevin Lock play for us against other teams? I think you'll find out it's on the 5th of July. And for me, this is, you know, when I, when I say the Arafal are not fit for Berbers, you know, you look at the Berbers of, of the Arafal. At the heart of 
that with the monitoring of the salary cap. If they're not able to monitor that and administer it properly, then they are not fit for the office. Just because you get a payment like this, it, it, you also can just keep adding into your money supply and you don't pay them a paycheck for it. Then you pay them for the item that they can pay. We have played a player that's getting to us the players to play. So it's a very spread by the way. Yeah, but not on the salary cap. They have not. I'm talking about clearance zero, a different issue with clearances and uh, we would have not come out and all of a sudden put Kevin Locke there. The way it works, you submit your 19th to the RFL and the RFL would then, you know, would give you the clearance, but the player was not 